Hey. Welcome to a special episode on Unbanned Coolies. We are privileged to delve into the enchanted realms of a literary legend, an author whose pen has sketched worlds that have transported millions into the lush landscapes of imagination and emotion. With over 400 books to her name, she is not only an author, she's a sorceress of stories, blending the elements of fantasy, history, and empathy, crafting tales that have become an interesting part of my childhood. A legend whose incredible contributions to children's literature and fiction have garnered her many awards, including the prestigious Caldicott Medal, the Nebula Awards, and the World Fantasy Award for Life Achievement. Renowned for my personal favorite book, Owl Moon, and How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight, and the Young Merlin Trilogy, her words have sculpted universes, nurtured minds, and whispered courage into the hearts of readers around the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, let us transcend into a captivating conversations with the great Jane Yolen. I think I'm going to go run away with that wonderful introduction. <laughs> Jane, can you share a childhood memory that, that you believe shaped your journey into becoming such a prolific writer? Let me give you two. How about that? Um, my parents uh, both were writers. All their friends were writers, uh, or so it seemed. Anyway, all the ones who came to our house. Um, and I'm talking about people like James Thurber and people like that. I mean, top writers. And I thought at that very young age that when you were a grown-up, you became a writer. I knew there were, um, you know, doctors. I knew there were school teachers. I knew there were, we lived in New York City. I, I could see policemen on the beat, that sort of thing. I thought they all went home at night and wrote. I really did. I thought whatever else I did in my life, I would go home at night and write. So I was, by the time I was four years old, convinced I was going to be a writer. Not that I had written much before at that point, but that's what I was convinced of. The, the other thing about my parents is that very early on, I had learned to read. My mother uh, helped me. I was reading before I was in, in school. And so they allowed me to read anything that they had on their shelves. And one of the things they had and gave to me was a, a the double collection of Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. That was the book, the two books that I think more than anything else made me the writer I am today. And I can still recite, you know, the Jabberwocky and and other things from from Alice in Wonderland. Um, it was their their being so open for me to read anything there. Now I, I must tell you, most of the books in their collections were adult books because I was the oldest child of two, so I was reading stuff that was way above what I could read. And if I didn't understand it, I made little stories around it so that I could understand those books. So those are the two things I think that made me a writer. I'm curious to know, was there a particular moment or a particular story from you when you were a kid that sparked your desire to create worlds through writing? Well, surely the Alice in Wonderland books. Um, that was that was prime. Right after that, I was reading of King Arthur. And so, secondarily, after Alice in Wonderland, King Arthur became a key figure in my thinking, in my understanding books, in my wanting to write that kind of book when I, you know, when I grew up and was an adult and wrote at night. My great grandfather owned an inn at one point. I think it was in the Ukraine because my people came from the Ukraine. Um, and he used to tell stories to the people who came to the inn. And people thought that he was a great storyteller, and that he made up the stories. And he used to tell the stories, not telling people what where they were from, as if he, they were his stories. And one of them it was uh, Romeo and Juliet. 
And he told them that this was his story, and he told them Romeo and Juliet. So, in a sense, my people, my my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, they were all storytellers. And they were all liars, too. So, um, when you tell a story, if it's not an actual story, but you're making it up, you could be called a liar, or you could be called a storyteller. And sometimes the world between those two things is very thin. Growing up, who were your author heroes, and how did their work inspire the stories you've created throughout your career? People like James Thurber. I uh, love James Thurber's books. Um, I didn't know who wrote the Arthurian books, but I was, but I assumed there was an author. I didn't realize until much later that these were a combination of many stories about King Arthur. It was not just one author. There were bunches of, of people who told these stories over and over again. Um, those were those were key. Um, I also had a lot of picture books that I loved. We were living in Virginia during the war years, World War II years. Uh, my father was off um, in London running the American Broadcasting uh, Company and, and uh, sending out news and disinformation uh, and jazz to, uh, you know, just off into the airways. Um, so, my mother and my baby brother and I lived with her parents in Virginia. And there, I, I, I ran into a range of other stories that I wouldn't have, I think, if I had lived in New York where I was born. And, um, and some of those stories I got from the, um, my mother would take, take my baby brother and me, um, two or three times a week in on the bus into Newport News to get new picture books. And among those picture books was about a bull who refused to fight. And that was very important to me because my father was where there was fighting. Uh, so that became an important book for me. Um, there was another book about a pirate who took care of a, a woman and her children who uh, were without a, without a father and husband at that time. And that book became important to me because that's how I was feeling. Uh, my parent, my grandparents were the pirates that took care of my, my um, uh, mother and my brother and me. So uh, the books that I was reacting to the most when I was very young, had as much to do with where we were living and how we were living and how we were living with my grandparents, um, as much as it had to do with the books themselves. How did your experiences, dreams, and stories from your childhood evolve into a career in writing? And when did you realize that storytelling was your true calling? Well, I thought for years that I wanted to be a newspaper man like my dad. And then I, when I was old enough and became, one summer, a newspaper reporter, a cub reporter, I discovered that what I was doing was telling stories. And not necessarily true stories. If I was sent out on a, uh, you know, to get a story and I couldn't get it, I would make it up. So I was a terrible, terrible journalist. But it was a good storyteller. Your book, The Devil's Arithmetic, mm -hmm. conveys the hauntingly tragic tales of events of a Holocaust through the lens of a young girl who's initially is detached from her Jewish heritage. The Devil's Arithmetic has been subject to challenges and has appeared on lists of frequently challenged books due to its sensitive and mature content regarding the Holocaust. If educators or librarians encounter challenges or a ban against the devil's arithmetic in their schools or libraries, do you have any advice or strategies you might suggest for them to navigate these situations, especially considering that the valuable conversations your book can inspire about history and empathy? First of all, right now, right now, the book is still being banned, um, taken off the shelves. Um, sometimes because it's someone who doesn't believe 
that the Holocaust ever happened. Sometimes because it's anti-Semitic. Sometimes it's because it's um, uh, there's a word in there at one point that's been pointed out to me, and the word is breast, because there's a scene in which the little girls who have been forced into the showers um, to take showers, and the guards, the big uh, German guards, are, or uh, were standing around and laughing at them, and they were stripped down, and they would hold their hands over their breasts and the word breast was the word that for some teachers not murder not uh, you know uh trying to kill all of these small children that was not what made them take the book out it was the word breast so but that wasn't the worst i had another holocaust novel that was burned on the steps of the Board of Education in Kansas City on a hibachi. They stole the book, took it out of the uh, took it out of the a group of a group of people who were against books that had any mention of homosexuality. Why I don't believe they did that. Yes. And they, they they burned all these books, mine included, on the steps of the Board of Education in Kansas City. Um, and um, it was stunning. You know, I mean, who heard, who ever heard of this? Well, I had, I had read about it, this sort of thing, years ago in a novel um, uh, about burning books. But there it was. I had a book that was burned. What did I do? I talked out. I talked about it. And a friend of mine who was gay writer, um, uh, wrote an article about it and got into all of the uh, all of the uh, major outlets, and the, and the book soared. It it by their taking it out of that library and burning it on the steps of education, the book leaped and and soared and went out to more people. Um, so, I think that that in some ways, burning books, taking books out, um, challenging books, um, it sometimes gives you a larger audience. But not the, what, the way things are going now are very dangerous. I tell people, if there's a book that you don't want your child to read, you have every right to with your child not read that book. And you can tell the teacher, can you give me a substitute book? But you have no right to tell the entire school that they cannot read that book. I want my child to read that book. Therefore, I can do for my child what, what is good for my child. If you don't want your child to read that book, you have every right not to have them read that book. But they won't thank you for it. I agree. When crafting a story that intertwines such deep historical pain with elements of fantasy and time travel, how did you navigate the delicate balance of maintaining respect and reverence for the actual events and suffering experienced by real individuals, while also creating a narrative that is accessible and impactful for young readers? I think the first thing was I took it seriously. I wasn't writing a a um a funny fantasy i was writing a serious fantasy but what i felt by taking it taking a girl a modern girl back to the time um of of the um holocaust was that she was able to ask questions that children of now would be asking because she already had the answers she was living at a time when we knew about what had happened and she goes back in time and and has and has to ask the questions there so it it gave me a way of going deeper um and darker and yet still hold on to hope because she knows that back in the the real world she still lives she knows 
back in the real world, her parents still exist. She knows back in the future, things will have resolved themselves. But the people, children, adults, what, whoever were involved in the Holocaust at the time did not have those answers, did not have those reassurances, did not have those uh, that ability to know what was going to happen. But she did. She was a carrier of a kind of truth. And it took people a while to understand what her message to them was. It was possible only because she could come from the future to the past with the message. Jane, I remember one of my favorite bedtime stories was your book, Owl Moon. It's a story about a girl and her father embarking on a serene yet adventurous nighttime quest through a snowy forest, all in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the elusive owl, subtly interweaving themes of patience, anticipation, and the magical bond shared between parent and child. Another popular book, How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? It's a whimsical picture book that explores various species of dinosaurs as they get ready for bed engaging readers with its playful rhyme and whimsical illustrations, and presenting bedtime antics that a child of all ages can relate to. In stark contrast of serene introspective ambiance of Owl Moon, this book infuses the bedtime routine with humor and mischief. I noticed that your diverse catalog spans across various themes and genres. What fuels your unwavering passion and inspiration to weave such diverse tales? It will amuse you to know that both those stories came from things that happened to my children or a friend's child. The first is my now late husband. Um, he, he died 17 years ago of cancer, but he was a birder. He was a stunning birder. He took all of the children out birding from the time they were very little. Now, he came from West Virginia. I came from New York City. In New York City, um, the uh, the birds there are pigeons. Totally uninteresting. But he grew up in the mountains of West Virginia. He was out there hunting, fishing, and birding, and going outside and learning about all the creatures that lived there. And birds were his favorite. And when he had children, when we had children, even when they were little, he would take them out in his arms and go birding with them. So Al Moon is the story of my daughter Heidi going out owling. She's a great owler now. She takes other people out owling. And she has a group called the Al Moon Gang, the OMG, the Al Moon Gang. The other one, the dinosaurs, began when an editor friend of mine, someone I had worked with for an, on a number of different kinds of books, called me up and, and said, my little boy Robbie is, is three years old now, she said. He loves dinosaurs and he can't, and he hates going to bed at night. Can you do something for him? So I wrote him a little poem. It was called, How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? Just a poem. And she called back and she said, I read him the poem. He went to sleep holding it. And he's sleeping now. And I said, oh, good. She said, but it's not just a poem. I said, yes, it is. She said, no, it isn't. It's a picture book. I went, really? Are you sure? And she turned it into a picture book, and it was called How Did Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? It did so well. I mean, it was an instant hit. It was did so well that they wanted another one and another one and another one. And now Robbie is a teacher himself. And there are maybe 30, 35 different um, how to dinosaur books all about all kinds of um, uh, different kinds of uh, things that we think about. And my, my new husband, because after after 17 years of being a widow, I, I met an old friend from, from college days, and we became husband and wife, and he was a teacher. And he was the one who said to me, this book is the perfect 
replication of what children do. They said, they, they, go, they go, oh, yes, I can, yes, I can, no, I can't, no, I can't. No. And it flops. He said, that's exactly what happens when they're learning. Um, and, uh, and they love that moment where, where you say, dinosaurs do this, dinosaurs do that, do dinosaurs do this? No. And it just, for me, I did it because it felt right in the poem. I felt right in the book. But he said it was a perfect teaching tool, which I had never considered at all. What advice would you give to your younger self embarking on a writing career? And does this advice hold still today? I would have said worry less about whether the book is going to sell and more about having fun writing. Um, because if if you're laboring over something and not having fun writing it or not having passion writing it, I mean, the, di the dinosaur books are fun to write. Al Moon was a gift to write. The, but The Devil's Arithmetic was a year's worth of research and writing and being put in the most difficult and ugly and horrible time that I could imagine. Um, and I couldn't imagine. I had to read about it in order to imagine it. But that find a place where you're comfortable in your writing. If it sells, fine. If it doesn't, that's fine too. It's the writing that is important. And as we draw our interview to a close, I'd like to peek into the future through your eyes. With your decades of storytelling and countless worlds created, how do you envision the future of children's literature evolving? And what message or wisdom would you like to leave for future generations of writers and readers who will navigate through their own enchanted force of narrative and imagination? Well, let me back up a bit. I was an editor um, when I came out, of, came out of college, and I was an editor of children's books for about seven years before um, I stopped that and just just wrote. And in all that time, there were maybe one or two uh, people of color who were publishing books. They were writing them, but they were not necessarily publishing them. And in children's books, there were those of us who were advocating for that. And I said, it's not enough just to have the writers. We need the editors who represent all of the different kinds and, and, and shades and colors and backgrounds of people that we, because there are children out there of the same, and they need to be served by those editors who are looking for those things. So it's finally come around. It's happening more and more. Um, you're seeing more and more books we're children of all sizes, ages, colors, um, backgrounds, um, uh, religions, uh, beliefs in the books for children today. Um, but that took a long while. And it was very slow coming. I think now that we're in an interesting and better place, though there's a lot of grumbling about who's doing what. But with the editors being also people of a varying backgrounds, it's it's opened up um, an enormous um, potential for these books to be even more relevant and more important in the lives of children. Viewers, as we bid farewell to our celebrated guest, we reflect upon the immeasurable depth and breadth of Jane Yolen's contributions to the literary world. Her storytelling has provided us with a trove of enchanted tales and has deeply altered the landscape of children's literature. Through her words, generations have been emboldened to dream, explore, and empathize with diverse worlds and characters. Her tales have extended an invitation to readers, both young and old, to explore the boundaries of their imagination while remaining tethered to the emotions that bind us all. Jane, we are profoundly grateful for your time 
insights, and most importantly, your literary contributions that have and will continue to ignite the glowing spark of wonder and wisdom in the minds of readers across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you next time. Good.